Today on The Independent, spring has sprung. Notre Dame opened its first spring practice on Thursday, and Pete and I will be here to recap practice number one and preview the month ahead for Notre Dame football. Welcome to the latest episode of The Independent. I'm Pete Sampson in South Bend, joined by my co-host Matt Fortuna in Chicago. Uh, Matt, one practice in the books. Um, all answers were revealed as uh, Notre Dame went. No pads, uh, but a lot of roll call, a lot of first impressions. And I think uh, there are a lot of things that struck me watching Notre Dame's practice on Thursday morning. But one is just like the volume of new faces that popped up, whether that is early enrollees uh, or grad transfers. There's a lot of new material for Notre Dame to work with and Notre Dame's coaching staff to, to try to get in the right spots. Certainly. And uh, I, I would say you were not overselling it with Benjamin Morrison's interception that you tweeted <laughs> about right after practice. The the social media team from the Irish was smart enough to put that out there. And holy cow, it really was obj ask. I mean, not surprised that he's the one making that kind of play out there. Uh, but but certainly a, a crucial spring. And, you know, I think spring ball sometimes can be a little bit overrated. It's not always as telling or predictive of what's to come in the fall. And, you know, I think it takes on different meaning in this portal era. But uh, we don't need to go over how important year three is for Notre Dame head coaches here. We know that this one in particular with the way the schedule set up, with the way the new playoff is there and with the expectations that are there for Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame along with all the, the number of new faces that are going to be expected to, con- expected to contribute from week one, I think is very, very important. you got four quarterbacks there. I think we all know who's going to win that job, but how it shakes out between now and the end of spring and what happens post-spring is absolutely worth monitoring. You have an offensive line that's been the backbone of this program for so long that has a lot of talent and has a lot of talent that got a lot of late season experience last year, particularly in the bowl game, but but is going to have to come along very, very quickly in replacing a couple of draft picks. And you've got, you know, at least from what Marcus Freeman said in his press conference after practice, um, I don't think he was overselling it when he was talking about the new receivers. He sounded pretty matter of fact as far as this is a different breed than what we've been accustomed to here the last two years. It's uh, he was right. I felt the same way. Uh, I think, you know, when I walked out of practice, the guys that, you know, you always have like, all right, who, who impressed me um, in this workout? And that can be a starter who took it to another level. It could be a new guy that, um, you know, you hadn't seen before who impressed, but aside from Benjamin Morrison, um, you know, that, that obviously jumped out. How could it not? But Beyond that, it was very, very heavy based with wide receivers. And that, I mean, there's, those are different guys. Um, I mean, Chris Mitchell and, and Jaden Harrison were impressive to me in a way that I, I'm not sure that I would have expected out of the gate. Uh, Micah Gilbert was impressive to me in a way that I think it was expected, um, you know, in terms of an early enrollee. But it's, you sit, it's kind of one of those things where you, you walk out of the practice and be like, all right, Notre Dame's receiver room added somebody from Florida International and Marshall, and they got a lot better. Exactly what did Notre Dame have at wide receiver last year? Uh, it it makes you sort of retrospect, look backwards and be like, wow, that group was farther off the pace than maybe I even would have thought because we all knew the receiver room was down last year. But, man, um, to see, and, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised because the year ended with a lacrosse player being the West, best receiver on the team. But um, the the position had a long way to go to get up to just power five level. Uh, but I think what we saw on Thursday morning made me feel like they're definitely power five level uh, and they have some guys that can go out and make plays. Yeah, I mean, it was, I feel like we maybe become a little too used to uh, Notre Dame just not being all that great at wide receiver. And I think that overlooks the fact that they were really, really bad Marcus Freeman's first two years. Coincidence or not. I mean, yeah, uh, you mentioned Chris Mitchell, FIU. I know the competition level is different than what he'll be facing in Notre Dame, but the guy had 64 catches for 1,118 1, yards and seven touchdowns last year. Uh, that would have been about three times as much as Notre Dame's leading receiver last year uh, among the wide receivers. 
Uh, Jaden Harrison, 20 catches, 410 yards, one touchdown, plus two kick return touchdowns. Uh, I, I went back. Notre Dame's a leading wide receiver. Again, tight ends have been pretty damn good there. Leading wide receiver. They haven't had one come back, a leading returning receiver come back to the program uh, since Equinamius St. Brown came back after 2016, and he led them again in 2017. Mm-hmm. Last year's leading receiver was Rico Flores Jr. 27 catches, 392 yards, one touchdown. For that, Lorenzo Styles, 30 catches, 340 yards, one touchdown. For that, Kevin Austin, who uh, 48 catches, 888 yards, seven touchdowns. Again, you see a huge difference between, and again, I'm not saying there's a line of demarcation between how Brian Kelly and, and Marcus Freeman recruited this position or how they had their coaches coach the position, but there is a serious drop off from the post BK era on. And it wasn't anything to write home about. I think for the most part during the BK era, Javon McKinley before that 42 catches, 717 yards, three touchdowns. Chase Claypool obviously is the one that really stands out as a, a, a bona fide mm-hmm. stud in 2019, six, uh, 66 catches, 1,037 yards, 13 touchdowns, and Miles Boykin the year before that, they made the playoff, 59 catches, 872 yards, eight touchdowns. Again, I think that position got highlighted because in those later years, we're talking about two of the last four Brian Kelly teams that made the playoff, and you saw the difference in that playoff. It was Clemson's wide receivers. It was Alabama's wide receivers and skill players. And you think, wow, that's where Notre Dame really has to at least try to close the gap. And they've gone completely in the opposite direction. Um, the last two years, and they're well aware of that. They've made changes inside and outside, and, uh, you know, the two guys they brought in who were there at spring I, obviously are, are making an early impression. Marcus Freeman's exact quote uh, was, quote, they can run. I saw more deep balls caught in this practice, and I've seen it a long time, end quote. I take him at his word with that. Uh, and then it's also interesting, Bo Collins was at practice um, in a, you know, viewing role. Rod Hurd, the Northwestern transfer, both those guys um, will not be eligible to actually – practice with the team uh, until the summer when they're enrolled. I was unaware, and I don't know if this is new or if this is just kind of business as usual now in the portal era, that they're enrolled at Clemson and Northwestern, respectively. They're presumably taking an online class. I guess Rod Hurd could be correct. Yeah. Be both. Um, but they're allowed at – they're living in South Bend. They're attending Notre Dame's practices. They can view it. And they're essentially full-on members of the football program while doing their schoolwork elsewhere. Not, not a bad deal, I think, for both sides. No. And, I mean, they are limited. I don't, they can't participate in team activities. So, it's, okay. it's more like they're – Like, can they sit in film? They can't sit in film Super room? assistant GA types. Um, yeah, I think they can, like, observe meetings. Like, it, But it's not – like, there are injured players at practice or banged-up players who are limited, and they're, they're in jerseys and running around, like, Bo Collins, you would have thought was like a GA um, at at first, because at first I was like, is, "Who is this new GA?" I was like, "Oh, it's Bo Collins." Um, on the receivers' point, one thing that really stuck out to me, and it, it's, I think you're sort of getting to the the crux of it with, "Wow, look at all these new players, and they're they're catching deep balls, and this is totally new and totally different." Was how I don't want to say he was unimpressed, but how matter of fact Mike Denbrock behaved during the practice. Where toward the end, Chris Mitchell caught a bomb over Jaden Mickey. It was like kind of a hope and a prayer from Riley Leonard, you know, in 11 on 11 period, took it in for a touchdown. Offense goes nuts. Everyone's celebrating. And Denbrock's like, I think his direct quote as he was yelling was, next play, next play, that's just what we do. And I was like, Mike, Mike hasn't been at Notre Dame in a while. That's not what Notre Dame does. They don't just do that. At so what Malik State Neighbors State. does. <laughs> yeah, at LSU, he's like, yeah, I mean, big whoop. We scored a, a touchdown in spring practice on a deep ball. Um, well, Notre Dame hasn't seen one of those in a while. So it, uh, if he can sort of set uh, an expectation level that Notre Dame is just going to produce big plays in the passing game, which has been a, a big change from the last couple of years, that would be a really nice, healthy perspective for Notre Dame to get to. Um you know, in day one, they at least they moved in that direction for sure. Absolutely. Um, again, with the, the question marks, I use air quotes with that for the offensive line. I, you know, Andre Kessemay is gone. It's obviously going to be a big loss, but I'm not too worried about the running backs as a as a whole. They've got at least three capable guys there. Devin Ford moving over to safety, I thought was was newsworthy, a bit of a surprise. I think that's a guy who. Uh, I, I, you got a better look at him, obviously, than I did being at practice today. But I don't know if you saw that one coming or not, or what his expected no, role is. No, I think that the defensive it's, backfield. 
I, I don't think it really has a whole lot to do with him being a defensive back and more with him uh, being in a position that tackles and practice tackling. Because if, if Devin Ford is going to have a chance to do anything with football beyond Notre Dame, it's going to have to be on special teams. So be a tackle first player in college for your last year and see if you can improve a little bit. And maybe just maybe there's a shot for you. But um, I look at that Ford move and think it has more to do with special teams than it does with getting on the field, the defensive back. It's not as deep as Notre Dame is at running back. It's not like they're short of bodies at safety. And I think if you're Ford, if you, if you have any hope of playing at the beyond college, it's a special teams ace so I would expect him to be on every special teams unit and why not practice tackling in practice uh, more than you could previously, maybe try to round out your skill set a little bit more. So that's sort of how I, I would see that. Cause it's even just watching practice today, Devin Ford is running with the threes and you look at the, the ones and the twos, you're down Rod Hurd, which, you know, you mentioned earlier, Adon Schuler, um, Luke Talich, Ben Minich, like all of those guys seem to be ahead of, um, you know, where Devin Ford is right now. And it's, you know, especially in the case of Luke Talich, who just went on scholarship, he's what, like six four two ten. 210. Um, that's exactly how you'd want a deep safety to look like. Um, Devin Ford, I have a hard time seeing how, how that would all fit together as a, a defensive back, but um for a skill development move, it's uh, for the player's point of view, I, I can understand it. Yeah, but I, I think it's noteworthy in the sense that the guy's old, very old. Um, yeah. You know, if he wanted to still play running back, I mean, he's class of 2019, if I'm not mistaken, for Penn State. Um, yeah, so we're talking nice. about a six, six year senior here who, if you want to play running back, I'm sure someone would have taken him as running back. Oh, yeah. I mean, like he, he was, I, I'm sure around. he had options to go somewhere else to play running back if he really wanted to, but it seems like he would rather just sort of be a, be a special teams player at a, a program that has a little bit more prestige behind it. And I, I get that too. Um, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't blame him if he went either direction on that. Um, you know, as a six year senior, you only got, you know, you literally are down to your last chance. Um, so, you know, th this would be the season to do it, but it's like the the defensive backfield. That that was something that was sort of sneaky, interesting to me. Less about Devin Ford and more about who they put in there next to Xavier Watts because there was no um, no Rod Hurd. I mean, you forget, you know, if Ramon Henderson was still here, he probably would have been running with the ones today, um, or at least close to it. Uh, but they put a Don Schuler out there going into sophomore year. Didn't didn't really get a ton of opportunities as a freshman. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if the Notre Dame knows exactly what they have there or don't have there. That the safety next to Xavier Watts will be an interesting uh, competition because really you look at the rest of this roster, there's not a ton of open jobs. Um, it's a it's a very old team, which is exactly how Marcus Freeman wanted it to be. Um, but the the job opposite Watts is is one of those jobs that is kind of worth watching. It's kind of an interesting position. Are you ready to forecast the Mickey Gray battle at corner? Because that one seems like it could be. Yeah, I, I'm i partial towards Gray. Um, I just think the way he's put together is more like how you would want a corner to be put together, you know, with extra length. Um, I mean, Mickey is an explosive athlete, um, but I feel like I see in very limited viewing Gray make more plays. Uh, and if that's – We'll see how that shakes out. They need both of them. Um, you know, Jordan Clark, the transfer from Arizona State, uh, Marcus Freeman sort of already anointed him as the number one nickel, but he was slowed in the first practice by some quad uh, soreness. So Clarence Lewis got some work there. And then Micah Bell was the third. Um, but I, you know, the gray Mickey job, my hunch would be gray, but I could. I could see Mickey holding on to that as well um, if he takes a step forward. And it sounds like Clark, I don't know if this is related, but it seems like he really labored through last year at Arizona State. Yeah. Health wise, I think it was a hammy, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, obviously a good veteran presence to have back there, but that could be worth monitoring uh, this spring as well. What do you think? 
I go back and forth on this one, and I'm sure the fan base does as well. And again, we're talking one spring practice ends. We're not basing it off the SS, but if you're projecting out the best position unit on the team, I mean, I, I think most reasonable minds would say D line or DBs. Um, I'm probably a little partial to the DBs, maybe because I don't know. I just feel like we're a lot more used to seeing great Notre Dame defensive lines, and we are great Notre Dame defensive backfields. And I think maybe my mind is just not used to that, and I'm more surprised and impressed by it. Mm-hmm. I also think. Candidly, you're you. I don't know where each position group will rank relative to their peers across the country, but as good as this defensive line is, I don't know if I'm ready to say like this could be one of the best units of the country just yet. Whereas I think the secondary might be a little bit closer there, even if that's largely on the back of Benjamin Morrison. Well, and they have the defensive player of the year nationally in Xavier. That too. <laughs> I keep forgetting that, by the way. Like. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, Devin Ford, yeah. Kind of whatever he did when he switched uh, from offense. <laughs> yeah, if ever you could sneak under the radar winning National Defensive Player of the Year, I kind of feel like Xavier Watts did. Um, yeah, so I'd say DB is number one. If you got the, the Watts-Morrison combination, maybe Gray there. Rod Hurd, I, I realize it's it's Northwestern. It's not Alabama or Georgia, but that guy played a ton of football. Yeah. Uh, and I think he will give you sort of DJ Brown plus uh, at the back of the defense. And if the stuff on Clark is legit, where what he showed last year at Arizona State was all, you know, none of it was quite at 100%, that would change your perception of that a little bit. So I I think DB is the clear number one. Um, defensive line is right there, though. And I don't know. I mean, it's one practice again. But, like, the quarterback room is really, really talented. And it was very refreshing to go out to spring practice and not have to pick apart anyone's throwing motion or convince yourself that the ball sailing with the nose down wasn't that big of a deal or the ball fluttering. Oh, they'll get that worked out. Or this guy missed the, he couldn't throw it to the net. That's fine. Let's not worry. Like all the quarterbacks have not the same throwing motion, but it's, they all have efficient, quality mechanics um that's from leonard on down to Carr. so they all, all four can play uh, that or have the tools that they could play down the road like that's i haven't always felt that way i mean there are some spring practices where i haven't felt that way about two quarterbacks right so the fact that you're sitting there with potentially four quarterbacks who can do that 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 to me feels like the the quarterback room should be should be a strength I mean, compare it to even Freeman's first year where he enters as a first-year head coach with zero career starts at quarterback on that roster, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And in this case, you not only have Riley Leonard in two years of starting experience at Duke, but even just seeing Steve Angeli in the Sun Bowl, whether that was a mirage or whether that was a teaser of what's to come, like that's comforting. I think there's a strength in numbers kind of – comfort, if you will, when, when looking at this roster Mm -hmm. and and looking at this quarterback group that to your point, I don't know if I felt that way going into here. I'm not saying by Leonard's going to be a Heisman candidate. I'm not saying CJ Carr is going to lead them to a national title in two years, but I just think having that many options in that room, even if, you know, Leonard will ultimately be taking the first snap against Texas A&M. I think it's a good place to start, especially when you have a veteran offensive coordinator there, Mike Denbrock, who just coached the Heisman winner last year. Yeah, the dual threat Heisman winner on top of that. Um, So that's that all is very healthy. Uh, Spring is around the corner, and that means it's time to get back outside with Roback, one of our favorite brands at the Independent. Whether it's polos, Q-zips, vests, crewnecks, or hoodies, Roback is our go-to apparel when it comes to the golf course, gym, sitting around the fire, or even recording a podcast. You've seen Roback sponsor former Notre Dame athletes Audric Estime, Kyle Hamilton, and Michael Mayer. And if you've attended a Notre Dame game, you've surely seen the Shamrock Polo around tailgates and in the stands. Roback goes by the motto, Crave Activity, and there's no better apparel to fit those needs. Listeners of The Independent can get 20% off your first purchase by using the promo code IRISH at Roback.com. Again, that's 20% off all hoodies, polos, Q-zips, and more on your first order. With the promo code IRISH, visit Roback.com. 
I think one thing that also struck me from Thursday was when they do team periods or seven on seven, um, they don't just sort of give reps away to the younger players. So when you see CJ Carr take a rep where he has the option of he's Jaden Thomas is the primary receiver, but Ben Morrison is covering him. Like that says a lot about how the staff feels about CJ Carr that they would even give him the opportunity to take that rep. When Micah Gilbert lines up and Benjamin Morrison is across from him, even if Benjamin Morrison jams him up and breaks up the pass, the fact that the staff feels comfortable enough that like, yeah, this makes sense to stick a freshman out there against an All-American just because like we want to see what he's made of or we think he can handle this. That that was another thing that I took away from practice on, on Thursday that – resonate a little bit. And I, I texted with a former Rame assistant coach just to see if I was seeing this correctly in, in a sense of like, if you, if you ever put a freshman against a frontline player who's a veteran at the beginning, like that, that has to say how you feel about that freshman or that younger player, because you're, you're not just wasting reps for the sake of the media uh, or social media. It's because the kid had earned the right to be out there. And he's like, yeah, that's, I don't know how they would do it, but like that's exactly how I would see it. If I'm going to stick a quarterback out there against an All-American DB, that means that quarterback has to be able to hold up on his own. Um, you know, this is – it's not a – you just don't get participation reps because you're here. You have to earn them. And I thought that Gilbert and Carr in particular felt – those looked like guys that were earning their, earning their reps very early on uh, in spring ball. One other note that I feel like is worth mentioning just because it was such a big offseason talking point as brief as the offseason was. And I, I texted some some people in the Goog the day before spring open. I, I asked, is Riley Leonard full go? And they said yes. The fact that wasn't even asked of Marcus Freeman was even noted, I think, in anyone's practice right up today after having yeah. the tightrope surgery and having the injuries he had last year. And again, I know they were not you know hitting each other today. Uh, the fact that's not even a discussion point right now, I think is worth noting as a positive sign and a positive trend for that position group. Yeah, that was, I don't, I feel like I tried to make a note of whether Leonard was braced up or extra taped up. And I, I can't remember seeing extra stuff there. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but I thought he moved around fine. That, yeah, the whole tightrope cleanup stuff is not, not it, it turned out to be as, inconsequential as it was portrayed uh, by a few people that I talked to around Notre Dame as it was, as that news was coming out. So uh, that Leonard looked no worse for wear. Uh, bit of housekeeping, Mitchell Evans, Kevin Ballman, Logan Thomas, Armel Mookum, and Aiden Gobira all out for spring practice with a collection of ACLs or labrums, depending on what the previous injury was. Uh, but Rocco Spindler was back uh, and, working with the second team on the offensive line. And that, that position remains the concern of the roster to me. Um, you know, Charles Jagasaw, I think, has a chance to be very good. Tosh Baker got beat a couple times by Jordan Botello uh, in sort of speed pass rush moves on Thursday. And, like, that's, that's the spot of the field where I just like, okay, are they going to have enough to hold up at A&M that – even though they've lost a ton of guys to the portal, it's still a very talented defensive line. Um, I think that's sort of a remains to be seen position for me. And I'm not sure that it will get figured out during spring practice. Marcus Freeman seemed optimistic that, you know, they'd be able to settle on five guys. I think the five guys who were with the first team today will be the five guys who were with the first team in college station on Labor Day weekend. Um, but that position they're they're going to have to sort of, I think, develop and improve what they have on the roster. Cause I, I'm not sure there's help coming in the transfer portal the way that it has at other positions. Yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, as there, there's getting it settled out as far as getting this group ready for week one, there's mm -hmm. getting it settled out as far as establishing your top five. I mean, right guards, the only one that's really up for grabs. And I mean, do you think, I'm not saying it's not going to be a competition. Rocco Spindler obviously has a lot of, or some starting experience, but the staff just seems very, very high in Billy Shrouth right now. And with Spindler coming off the injury, I mean, I wasn't surprised to see Shrouth out there with the ones, 
but I do wonder if they'll mix and match a little bit in the spring while they have the time just to give each other a fighting each guy a fighting chance. Yeah, I I don't know. It I, I'm sure that they will sort of spread that wealth around a little bit. I I wouldn't be surprised if Emil Wagner got some reps at one of the tackle positions to sort of force the issue and see like all right, can you can you give us an alternative to Tosh Baker if we need it? Um but the rest of it, I think Marcus Freeman noted probably six, seven, eight guys in competition to, to start. I think that's probably more like six, realistically, with right. Spindler being the sixth guy. Um, you know, Spindler would be a very valuable part of the offensive line, but this year may just be more in sort of backing up two or three positions, depending on what Notre Dame needs. So I I think that the, the offensive line overall, that – it's going to be a work in progress for a while. I think Notre Dame knew that coming into spring practice, not, not going to change on day one. That's fine. Um, but that position will probably need a, lo- a lot more refinement and development moving forward. Am I wrong in that? At least my concern, and I think most people's concerns are heightened by the fact that week one is on the road, probably in prime time in the SEC where it's going to be, easily the hottest conditions any of these guys have ever played in in their life. Like for that group to be fully in sync in that environment. I know we both talked to people who have said that's one of, if not the hardest places to coach and play, regardless of however good or bad AM is in a given year. I just think the sense of urgency around that position is at an all time high right now because of the challenge they're facing in week one. Uh, I, there's a lot to that. Um, I mean, I think back the last time Notre Dame had more of a developmental offensive line was 2020, um, where they moved a bunch of pieces around, position really struggled. Uh, they ended up going to Virginia Tech. I'm sorry, 2021. Um, I think that that was the year they went to Virginia Tech and sort of the Kevin Austin, Jack Cohn, yeah. they replaced him with Tyler Buckner. Like oh, Buckner. You, you, yeah. you saw when, when you have an offensive lineman that can't hold up, you saw how the entire offense collapse can collapse. Um, so yeah, that, that is a big concern for me going to Texas A&M. Um, you know, Mike, but I do think the experience of Mike Denbrock should help. He's, he's called plays in Kyle field before they, they lost when they played there, but he should know what that environment is going to be like getting into it. So there in theory, it shouldn't be as big of a shock as maybe some past, huge Notre Dame road moments have been what I'm thinking at Georgia 2019 when it was just like a false start marathon for a while. Um, but yeah, the, the offensive line, the urgency to sort of get that down and get that down with the new quarterback, get that down with a new play caller. Um, that probably won't be heightened until training camp begins, but it would be good for Notre Dame and good for Riley Leonard if they came out of the blue gold game and be like, all right, we know who our first five guys are now get to work over the summer. We'll see you in August where we can pick up where we left off. That would, that would be a significant win. I think for the group this spring, George is probably the the app comparison. I had 2017 Miami in my mind, just as far as an environment that they just were not prepared for at all. Not that I think this game would be a blowout either way, but you know, as far as just, this is not a game they normally play. When's the last time they played on the road? Well, Georgia, obviously, but other than that, even even the Georgia game, though, I mean, they were pretty substantial underdogs going into that one. Yes. I think the disappointment in that game was, wait, they actually had a chance to win this, and they kind of shot themselves in the foot, you know, with uncharacteristic mistakes on that stage. But I, I just think the environment and the magnitude of, of that opening night, presumably game, is um, it just adds a sense of urgency to a position group that hasn't had a whole lot of it outside of 2021. No, it's, I mean, look, Notre Dame playing well on the road is something that Marcus Freeman really hasn't figured out, you know, in his first two yeah. years. It's not, you know, it, it's not just been like terrible all the time. I mean, they went to North Carolina and won. They played well against BYU and won. But, you know, USC, the end of that first year, um, Louisville, Clemson. I mean, even, I would even pulled up the Duke game as an example of oh, yeah. not playing well on the road, even though they won it, you know, North Carolina state was kind of a weird one last year uh, with the weather delay, but I, yeah, that offensive line is, they're going to have to prove a lot. Marcus Freeman's going to have to prove a lot. And I mean, the way the schedule shakes out, I don't know if this is one of the years where 10 and two is going to make it. So 
if you can right. if you can go get the win at Texas A and M, in theory, you should be in excellent shape to make the college football playoff the rest of the way because I don't see a game on the schedule until who knows what Florida State will look like in November. Who knows what USC will look like at the end of November? Um, to me, Texas A and M is the toughest game on the schedule, and it, and and yet it's also one where I feel like Notre Dame has a very very good chance to win it. Completely, I, I would add Louisville to it's a possible trap game just because you can't over, not trap yeah. games, but games they could lose because you can't overlook them after last year. But again, Louisville's I I'd be surprised if Louisville's as good as they are last year. I've I'd be shocked if Florida State's as good as they are last yeah. year, and both those games are at Notre Dame Stadium, so. It's not something I'd be losing sleep over just yet. A couple housekeeping notes. Marcus Freeman mentioned some of this we knew, some of it uh, less so. Dylan McCullough added associate head coach title to his running back coach duties. Mike Mickens is now a DB's coach. Marty Biaggi, special teams coordinator, will help with the DBs. Well, it sounds like that's a lot more than helping. He's going to be basically the full-time safeties coach, from my understanding, or close to it. Yeah. Uh, Chad Bowden is now the assistant AD for player personnel, a.k.a. GM. Uh, Andre Brown is moving up the ladder, replacing Bowden as director of recruiting. And Max Bola, as we talked last episode, is linebackers coach as well. So uh, strong offseason overall, I think, for Notre Dame in the coaching staff department as well. Um, and, you know, here, as we said on March 7th, they won a spring practice where I'd say maybe half the schools in the country are starting spring schools, probably spring schedules, maybe a little less than that. Um, if you look at any coaching trackers around the country, mine included, there are a lot of schools that still don't have full staffs or anywhere close to full staffs filled out. Um, in the case of Georgia State, you know, they had to cancel spring practice two practices in because their head coach left and they're in the process yeah. of hiring and rehiring. So uh, Notre Dame's in about as healthy of a place as you can be right now as far as having everything stabilized and having it stabilized with familiarity. I mean, everyone they brought in who wasn't uh, a full-time on-field coach last year whether that's Bulla, Denbrock, or uh, in the case of Mike Brown, our guys Marcus Freeman has worked with or have worked at Notre Dame before. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think there's a huge acclimation period as far as getting everyone on the same page here. No, it's a program that I don't want to say they have everything to make a run at the playoff, but oh, they playoff they do. to make a run yeah, at the playoff. They, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, we'll see. I mean, maybe a run in the playoff, like, I guess. Uh, a run at the playoff and a run in the playoff are two different things. But, um, you know, this the staff, not just the continuity of the staff, but like continuity of really good coaches. Right. You know, Golden and Denbrock in particular. I think that, you know, I don't know if you would agree or disagree with this. Do we do we overstate the impact of position coaches and understate the impact of good coordinators? So I feel like a good coordinator can make a a decent position coach really good, but a good position coach can't make an average coordinator great. And I think that Notre Dame has like borderline great coordinators at both both ends. And I think that will serve the rest of the staff really well. Um, you know, it's it's not that they don't have good position coaches. I think McCullough is excellent. Al Washington, very good. Mike Mickens, of course. Um, but you marry that with like very very highly skilled coordinators. I think it has a chance to be a, be an outstanding staff. I think that's, there's definitely some truth in that. I haven't thought about it that deep. I mean, I do think that's more true on defense and offense. Cause I think mm -hmm. you need to play as a unit more as, as, as a defense. And a lot of that comes down to coaching, whereas offense, you know, Texas A&M still making money off Johnny Manziel, Kevin Sumlin got a lot of money and a lot of jobs off Johnny Manziel. You know, you, you get the right players in on offense, particularly the quarterback. It can make everyone else look good. But, uh, no, it's a healthy place to be in right now if you're nerdy. No question about it. I mean, to have two coordinators in their 50s and 60s who've been there, done that. They're on four-year deals. Um, Jack Swarbrick has talked about this. I mean, it's his job. He says every year, this is the best the program's ever been in, and this is the best <laughs> staff I've ever seen. I I'm more inclined to agree with him this year than others. Um not that Brian Kelly's staffs weren't great, although he had some pretty dud hires, you know, over the years as well. Um, this this is probably as as it, look you go into last year with the way the OC search went, and you have questions. You you have a lack of yeah. confidence and certainty about how they're going to be in certain spots, and I think a lot of those worst fears came to fruition. I don't have any fears about 
Like if they lose to AM, and they're going to lose to a team that's probably got better players. And might look, they they might have better coaches too, but I don't think it's because yeah. the coaches at Notre Dame are not going to put them in the best position to succeed. Um, and even then, I think you know we learn what this staff is about sometimes the way we have the last few years and in, in, in some not great situations. Like, can you win all the games you're supposed to win? Like yeah. they have yet to what, do that. I mean, you years. mentioned Louisville. Like, right. should, shouldn't be a trap game because based on what happened last year. But the kind of game where, I mean, you can't have a Stanford or a Marshall. Um, you can't have. But they've got a lot of, the schedule has a lot of Stanford's and Marshall's. You, yeah, like, there's not a lot you, of Louisville's. Or, like, even Ohio. though Louisville was on it, there's not a at Louisville. There's not an at Clemson right. necessarily. So it, um, you know, go undefeated at home. Do that. Yes. Split USC and A&M. If you do that, you're in the playoff, right? You're not you're not losing at Georgia Tech. You're not losing to Army or Navy. You're not losing at Purdue, right? Like Purdue, Purdue would be the one of a high end like ooh, this is a game Notre Dame needed to win by 14 points. And I realize Brian Kelly has won won some nail biters at Purdue with pretty good teams, but. Um, that that would be kind of a maturity test type game for me because it's like you're way better than this team. I get it; it's on the road, but um, that's that's the kind of game. And then come back. I think Louisville might be a week or two later. Like those are those are the kind of games that you'd like to feel like Notre Dame staff is mature enough, its head coach is mature enough, and its roster is mature enough that you don't have to worry about those quite as much as maybe you had the last couple of seasons. Three true road games. I don't know if we've like driven that point home. And, you know, we've talked about two of them plenty, the first and the last, Purdue's the third. I mean, the Georgia Tech game's at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. That's right. If Notre Dame has more fans there than Georgia Tech, I will not be the least bit surprised. Um, no, I think that I think that there's a section of the Notre Dame fan base, like the Southern section is sort of treating it almost like the BYU game for the Western section of the fan base. It's easy. It's much easier to get to Atlanta than it is South Bend. So yeah, you get to both pretty easily directly now, right? Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's again, I hate to say this far out is the easy schedule. And as we've seen with USC, particularly USC games, you know, at USC where you're closing out the regular season, it is a fool's errand trying to predict how that program will be in any given year. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. I go back to 2012 above all else when that was the preseason number one team in the country that I think lost five games in Notre Dame, clinched the number one seed in the BCS by beating them in that game. And even uh, that game was a pain yeah. in the ass for Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean, every game for Notre Dame was that year with the way yeah. they played. They That's they true. they were able to pull quite a few out on the strength of that defense. But um, it, it, A&M may be more of a mystery program than USC because they have a new staff and because they've always been teaming with this potential but never been able to get over the top because of all the familiarity on both sides with these staffs and players because it's a challenge and a, 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 you know, a venue and an atmosphere and environment and weather and all that, that Notre Dame really is not familiar with at all because it's the first game of the year. I just think the, the, the intrigue and the number of unknowns around that one are, uh, are great. I mean, not that USC isn't great, but it's Notre Dame USC. We get it every year. Uh, yeah. This is different. It's unique. There are some real, serious expectations uh, for Notre Dame and its staff going into this season and the rubber meets the road from week one and uh, like game day better be there. I know Clemson plays Georgia, but I believe that's a neutral site venue and I don't believe in you should be anywhere other than a college campus for uh, a college football show in one man's opinion. Nick Saban's first game. Oh no, Saban might be in Dublin because they're doing game day for Georgia Tech, Ooh. Florida State in week zero. I don't know if Saban's contract will call for him to travel overseas for media duties, but that would be something too. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, it's the Ohio State opener was was huge for obvious reasons uh, two years ago. Um, but I don't think anyone's really thought going into that one like, all right, what's going to happen here? Like, who's going to win? Um, this one, I think everything's up for grabs and it's, it's really, really intriguing this far. Even, even here, Marcus Freeman talking about, 
he used a phrase today along the lines of like, this is a slow build to our great challenge at AM or something to that yeah. extent. It was like, okay, yeah, you weren't talking about that with Navy last year. No, no. And it's, I think, the first year you're trying not to talk about it with Ohio State unsuccessfully. Um, so that's just sort of how that, uh, how that off season went, but I mean, it's a good point on the schedule and it kind of gets to the most interesting sort of big picture point with Notre Dame is just like how, how Marcus Freeman deals with the expectations of needing to win, uh, that the time for like learning as a head coach, I think has ended because you have the staff in place and the roster in place to make a run to, and perhaps in the college football playoff as we get our prepositions, right. Um, cause he just he just hasn't had that kind of pressure yet here, and I mean even go to you know, it's, it's that time of year at the athletic where Stu Mandel and Bruce Feldman put out their top twenty five coaches. Marcus Freeman isn't on it um, because he he wasn't he eligible though. Yeah, he doesn't have a track record to be on it. But I think in Stu's mailbag, somebody asked like, "Why no Freeman?" And he's like, "Well, it's kind of a little bit of a career achievement, a little bit of." you know, winning at the highest level. And he said he struggled with, you know, Dan Lanning, where to put him on there. Well, Dan Lanning wa- has won a conference title. Uh, he's won a major bowl game. Marcus Freeman has won the Gator Bowl and the Sun Bowl. And I think Stu's point was basically like, he better be on my top 25 list next year. Cause if he's not, he's on a different kind of list. Um, and so how, like how Freeman deals with those kinds of expectations where there is, there's a win now you have to start delivering on all of your potential on Saturdays in a way that you could kind of get away with a Stanford. You could kind of get away with a Clemson or a Louisville the last couple of years. I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to get away with those games um, with the expectation levels of the team elevated to the point where they are. Yeah, actually Bruce, Bruce put Feldman put the disclaimer. He won't put anyone year three or younger in there. Okay. And I do actually had Dan Landing in his, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't expect him to be on there just yet. I do think Dan Landing's accomplished more through two years. I personally think he's a little, little overrated. Um, oh, and three against his rival being fit in Washington, being favored twice, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it, it, it all adds though to the, the, just kind of the fascinating undertow of this season and how this administration is completely supported uh, Marcus Freeman and this football staff, they seem to be all in in a way that a, at the right time, where, again, the 12-team playoffs going to be very, very conducive to Notre Dame competing for national championships every single year. And I think in this year in particular, it should be a playoff robust kind of campaign, especially with the schedule that's put in front of them. Uh, you know, March 18th, I think, Swarbrick's done and Pipa Bach was in. Again, I don't think it's going to be some grand, like, changing of the guard there's a new sheriff in town let's all relearn this guy's administrative language but the guy who hired you will not be there anymore um yep. that is significant uh there will be a new president very soon uh, there's a lot of change happening around notre dame there's a lot of change happening around college football uh but i think notre dame has adapted pretty well to it and, and in my personal opinion the the speed at which they've adapted at least over the last year has impressed me because it wasn't always the case, even going back to a year ago. And I think um, seeing where they are, seeing the coaching staff come together the way it did, even hearing Marcus Freeman relay a tale about Dem- Mike Dembrock saying, you know, LSU is great too, but I came here for you guys. You know, I know that's, you know, kind of recruiting press conference banter that the head coach is going to put out there. But I think there is like some strands of truth within that. Um, the same way, uh, not Brian, I want to say Brian Kelly. Jack Swarbrick goes on the Irish Illustrated podcast and says, uh, you know, our coaching staff likes it here because they know what they're getting. Um, uh, because you know, unlike Texas AM, and I don't know if you mentioned them by name or not, but he's definitely talking about them. Uh, you know, you're not coaching at a place where you're gonna have 40 transfers from other schools come in on a given year. Um, I think that continuity has bred stability. Uh, and, and attractiveness for Notre Dame to be a, a, a play a good place to work for. And Marcus Freeman seems like a good guy to work for relative to a lot of his peers as well. So they got a lot going for them right now. Um, <clears throat> they'll take a bit of a break here before spring break um, coming out of spring practice number one. Um, <clears throat> I believe they might have pro day before 
Spring practice number two, if I'm not I believe mistaken. it's spring practice number two is on Wednesday, March 20th. Oh, pro day. Yeah. pro day is the very next day. Um, That's so, right. yeah, Notre Dame, on a, on a bit of a hiatus. I will be uh, taking a bit of a, well, I'll be t- a work trip next week where uh, I think on the athletic, hopefully we'll, we'll be get three interesting stories uh, from the States of Alabama and Mississippi. I'll let people fill in the gaps of what those stories might be, but um, should be some interesting travel. Matt, I'm not sure what uh, you're working on on the inside zone these days, but uh, has anything sort of got your attention to spring practice gets rolling. Yeah, just spring practice around the ball, around the, the the globe, calling as many people as possible, just seeing what's what and putting together the final pieces of, you know, whatever remaining staff holes are out there across the country. March Madness obviously coming up. Micah Shrewsbury got a win right after coming on our pod over Clemson. We'll ignore what happened in Chapel Hill a few nights after that. Um, happens to anybody. It happens I to also, the best of us I, in Chapel Hill. What's that? I say that happens to the best of us in Chapel Hill. <laughs> uh, I was unaware until I saw a story in the Boston Globe today that Brad Stevens' kid is walking on at Notre Dame next year. Uh, and considering I'm host coasting this podcast with the biggest Brad Stevens stand in the world, I'm shocked <laughs> that did not make our way into our conversation with Micah Shrewsbury um, when he was on last week. Yeah, I should have like there the sidebar to advice on coaching your own kid is how do you coach uh, the kid of your former boss? Um, that that will be kind of an interesting dynamic for Notre Dame hoops last year. I mean, I will like, even though they got smoked at North Carolina, I thought the clubs of performance was good. Yeah. Brad, Brad Stevens son, uh, Notre Dame hoops is the place to be for NBA general managers and executives kids. Um, it's yeah, it's, and I, it was nice to see, the, the, there is a chance Notre Dame could still make the NIT, even with the losing record. The the sort of selection process has changed a little bit there. So curious to see the, see them in the ACC tournament, however long that lasts. But uh, whatever success they have, obviously we'll put that down to Micah getting a independent bump. We'll end it on that note. Positive basketball, positive football. Uh, he's Pete. I'm Matt. It's a pleasure speaking to you guys as always. We'll be back. Also, we'll see about Pete with his road trip, but we'll be back hopefully next week. We should have another pretty special guest joining us uh, to talk about Notre Dame at large uh, before the Irish return in a couple of weeks after spring break to resume, resume spring practice. So for Pete, I'm Matt. Thanks, as always, for listening to us on The Independent.